Uh, speaking as a student from, uh, as a former student from Hong Kong University, I'm very glad that we had this tournament. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to first thank all the volunteers and the organizing committee for a fantastic job. I think the volunteers are fairly obvious in their white t-shirts, but still, could I have all of you stand up so everyone knows you if they haven't seen you enough? I'll highlight that most of these are freshmen. They've only been on the team and in fact in this university for a couple of months. So their participation is with, founded with well gratitude. So for the grand final today, I'd first like to introduce the judging panel who are still coming in. So the panel consists of Lok. Lok, say hi. We have Jumbo, TJ, Tate, Natalie, Jen, and myself, Sandeep, I will be your chair. Now to introduce, thank you, now to introduce the teams of the grand final. In opening government, we have Peace and Love, represented by LP and Ashok. In opening opposition, representing Ateneo, we have Ateneo A, Daryl, and Gerald. In closing government, from ICU, we have ICU T, Yuki, and Koki. And finally, also from Japan, Akira A, Koa, and Chiaki. So we will start the debate in a moment. Just as a refresher, the motion today is this house would ban the publication of pre-election survey slash poll results during election periods. Let's begin in just a minute. Let me sit down. Thank you. Somebody do a mic check. Do a mic check. The POI is the mic for POI. There's no mic for POI. Guys, yell your POI, please. So I call this house to order, and to begin the debate, may I call upon the Prime Minister. <laughs> Twelve years ago, yesterday, in the year 2000, in George Bush versus Al Gore, exit polls were starting to be published on the news media at about 6 p.m., which showed that George Bush had a lead in major swing states. Ultimately, voters on the West Coast, in other states, and even in Florida itself, started to believe those polls and didn't show up and exercise their vote. Today, we know that George Bush won by a little over 500 votes in that state thus giving the election by the closest margin ever. We think that the publication of exit polls before an election harmfully influences the perception of voters and it creates an illegitimacy or the perception of illegitimacy for those people who have won that election and for democracy haven't been served at the end of the day. And that's what the opening house is going to uh, stand for and why we're going to ban all exit polls, all surveys to be published before the results of an election. Let's look into the simple model. Of the um, basically, yeah, we're going to ban all polls. That's the model. Good. I'm going to talk about three points. I'm going to talk about why deliberative democracy is about individual expression. I'm also going to talk about why the perception of the effects of polls on the election is very important, and most importantly, that the perception that democracy has been done and is legitimate. And finally, why every single vote counts, even when you're in the opposition. 
let's look at the first area of, of substantiation. Deliberate democracy is about individual expression. We think that democracy is founded on the idea that everybody has the right to vote, but more importantly, that everybody should be able to exchange the ideas and the thought processes from other individuals and weigh those issues out in what we call the free marketplace of ideas. We think that's very important for those issues to come out. We think that all those views need to come out versus the idea that other people's opinion, just because of the number of those people come out and say that they're in, in for that, we think that that's problematic. Please sit down. We think also that these individuals basically need to vote for what's best for themselves at the end of the day, after they've been able to weigh up those issues. Because ultimately, a democracy only functions when we're able to deliver the needs and the wills of the people. And that quality of the functioning is impaired when individuals start voting for other things. And I'll get into that, but before then, opening. It's a legitimate option for you not to vote in your U.S. context. It's a legitimate option for you to vote for a third party in that context. Why is it not a legitimate option to vote based on a number that you believe in? I, I'll get into that in a second, where I talk about paradigms where there are compulsory voting, but also, let me just quickly answer that. Look, when you don't express that opinion, and when the vote becomes that close, it gives the legitimacy to those opposition parties and those other individuals to become indignant and stall the, the wheels of government as we see today where elections are so close because people feel that they have no voice in the matter and no longer choose to vote on those issues and no longer come out to vote, many of those issues, even those state elections that are affected, grind the halt of the lower house of, of, of Congress within the United States to a standstill that make us on the precipice of what they call the, the financial cliff. And those types of things stall democracy. And we think that by eliminating them, more people could be more inclined to express their opinion. But finally, let's look at the quality of the functioning of democracy. Because you can't begin to actually deliver what the people want when they don't express those votes. And we think that's very important. And because of that, that's going to be harmful. Why is... Right? We think when the news and the media publish these polls, they influence the individuals and they influence their choices. Because we move into the second area of perception of the effects on the polls on the election. Because in, even when you talk about a compulsory voting idea, what happens is individuals start voting on what other people want and what other people perceive to be the voting criteria, uh, criteria instead of voting on what they think is a legitimate uh, issue and expression of their votes. And why is that wrong? Because when you don't get that, and when individuals and politicians look at the closeness of those uh, opinion poll, look at the closest of those elections and look at, at that a mandate to either obstinate or stand against policies, we think that's problematic. We think because of that, it forces people to even turn away further from the electoral process and further turn away from their politicians and not being able to represent their views. We think that that's the harm that comes on a second level about the perception of those polls on the election at the end of the day. Please sit down. I'll take one from closing if you have one. That's good. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Let's look into the third area of why every single vote counts. Right? Because what I've been telling you up here is that whether or not you have the right to express that opinion, whether or not you choose not to express that opinion, is harmful to the democratic process. And when when you are inclined and encouraged to actually think about that process and to think about the issues of on the table in front of you, we think that that is what encourages these individuals to come out, especially when you look at my minorities and the opinions of the opposition voice, and whether or not those, those minority voices are actually being able to express their ideas. Because we don't think there is a problem to publish those polls after the election, to actually look at what those constituencies and how they voted on those issues. And I think that also helps the deliberative democracy and the representatives able to deliver that, and before six minutes. Why can you say that it is not legitimate to bandwagon on a winning candidate, but say that it is legitimate to say that I'm not voting for Barack Obama because it's black? Because at the end of the day, those politicians are elected to represent you. And so if you don't represent or you don't elect those individuals, and you elect them on issues that don't matter to you, then the, then the government no longer reflects the individual of the state. The government no longer delivers the effectiveness and the ability of, of what their constituents and the electorate want. And that's the problem with the election process. And that's what continually feeds back on itself and turns those voters away from the election process. We think because every single voice vote counts. And when you look at those minorities and when you look at those other issues and how they voted and why certain groups voted a certain way, 
We think that's the ability for the for the politicians to then look at that afterwards. And we think that the influence that that has on the voter beforehand is very detrimental. What have I talked about? I've talked about how exit polls, polls and surveys have undue influence on the electoral process. This might seem minute, but ultimately, because the individual isn't able or isn't willing or sometimes overcome by other people's individual expressions, their choices aren't being able to be exercised. And that feeds back on itself and destroys the quality of democracy and hampers those elected individuals to actually deliver to the constituencies what they want. And because there's a perception that the effect that the election is no longer legitimate or that for those politicians that what they're doing is legitimate action, it allows them to carry away and stalemate the process versus giving us a decisive and clear action of what politicians should do. So please, rock the vote. I thank the Prime Minister for his speech. Now to open the case on the opposition, may I call upon the leader of the opposition. Here, here. Similar say, Mr. Chair, that there are certain preconditions for democracy, for, for democracy to be able to be actualized. What are these preconditions? We think, Mr. Chair, that a well-informed society, a society that knows where the votes are going and knows the effects of the actual votes, is something that is necessary for democracy to be practiced fully and to be practiced in a right particular way. I'm going to argue to you two things coming from my speech. First is the idea of how it's a legitimate political strategy to take for individuals to vote based on numbers and based on the statistics that were given in a particular poll in a particular survey. And second, I'm going to talk to you about the idea of how it allows people to second guess or reconsider the second options when voting and how that sort of thing is actually much better for democratic principles that each and every team here would like to progress forward. Now before that, ladies and gentlemen, let's rip out a couple of ideas coming from the previous speaker. Because the first thing it tells us is this idea that it's an illegitimate vote, that if you're voting on a statistic, then suddenly it's something that is wrong, and suddenly it's something that doesn't actualize your expression and doesn't solve the purpose of voting. The first response is we don't think that's necessarily the case. Because we argue to you, and this is already bleeding into substantive, that we think that individuals aren't necessarily coerced into voting for a particular individual just because a statistic is released, ladies and gentlemen. That's why, even if statistics are released that an individual or a particular candidate might not possibly win, you still have individuals that don't necessarily move to another candidate just because the particular polls have been released. But the second reason on why we think this sort of thing is a legitimate expression of, of a political vote is because we think it's an objective fact, ladies and gentlemen. When statistics and when polls are released, essentially these things are things that are true, and essentially these things are things that people have control of because they can choose to move to another candidate or choose to move to another candidate that could also serve their particular interests. So the third reason on why we think it's a legitimate thing to, uh, to vote on a particular statistic is because we think it's a, it's, it's a well, possible political strategy to take. What does this mean? We think, ladies and gentlemen, the reason on why people have the right to vote and the reason why people can vote is so that that vote could represent their interests, so that they could voice out their concerns. The thing is, if they vote for a particular candidate that might not have a chance to win, or that might not necessarily deliver because they know that that candidate is in the super minority, then we think, ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of why the vote was given to, to, to an individual in the first place isn't actualized. So we think it's legitimate for anyone to choose or to move to another candidate based on the statistics and based on the polls of objective fact that was released because of these things. Because the vote is only actualized if that individual can maximize the capacity of that vote. So if the person thinks that he would want to move to another candidate because that the, the original candidate he was voting for was losing, then that vote is still actu uh, actualized and that person still fulfills the purpose of why he wanted to vote in the first place. We don't think that there's anything wrong with that idea and that's why it's a legitimate strategy to take. 
But the second argument, and the second reason why we think that voting on this particular reason on voting based on statistics is a good thing, and why these polls actually help promote the principles of democracy, is because it allows people to reconsider the second options. The premise is this. A statistic, or any poll that is released, is just like any information that is given towards the public. Like, for example, what Mitt Romney wants to do with a particular policy, or you know, Obama's um, campaign, or, or Obama's four years in office. These things are information that are released to the public, and that influence the public in different ways. You might move to another a candidate because the particular information is released. We're willing to say from opposition side that there is no difference in terms of that information. Information is just information and those things are just objective facts that actually help individuals actualize certain principles of democracy. But what are the particular principles we're talking about and how are these things actualized? Two reasons. But before I move on to those particular reasons, closing. Okay, given the fact that there are other types of information which is available to the citizens, why it is uniquely necessary for people to access this kind of information um, like uniquely? We think, ladies and gentlemen, it's unique because if an individual votes for someone who will not win, therefore the reason of why he's voting or the, the purpose of his vote isn't actualized. So it's unique to say that it's a different strategy when you're voting for a candidate that could win. It's a legitimate strategy to, just, to take. Two principles and how they're actualized under our model when we're talking about releasing surveys and polls. The first reason is because it allows individuals to hedge their votes and allows for individual to go against a coalition of the opposition. What essentially does this mean? We think, ladies and gentlemen, once information is released, people are now allowed to recalibrate their vote, can now choose for an individual who might be in the super minority. What does this mean? If there are different individuals running for a particular, for like, I don't know, for, for the presidency, ladies and gentlemen, and one individual is winning by 30% and everyone else is losing by a particular number, if that individual wins in a super minority with 30% Mr. Chair, we don't think the idea of democracy is really actualized. We think, ladies and gentlemen, what polls allow individuals to do is they allow other individuals who are voting for different candidates to move to another candidate, to make concessions, to have discourse, and to choose another candidate that they might not have initially thought of in the first place, but could still well represent the, the ideals and the, and, and the, and the um, interests of that particular individual. So, if we want an individual, or if we want a vote to really be heard, and if we want individuals to have their interests put forward, then we think it's better done if we don't have individuals winning on a super minority, and if we allow individuals to recalibrate their vote based on that statistic. But the second reason on why we think another principle of democracy is put forward is because we think it for, for fosters a move towards the center. What does that mean? If an individual, let's say like Daryl, who's very Republican, walks or, or, or essentially wants to vote all Republican for a particular party, or for, for a particular uh, election, and it, it turns out that individuals in that area, or individuals he's voting for, isn't necessarily winning, then, ladies and gentlemen, Daryl would more often not participate in the political discourse, would also participate and talk about what are the alternatives, because I have two candidates that are losing, or in, 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 in the Democratic political party that also might want to put forward my interests. So ladies and gentlemen, you have Republicans making concessions towards the Democratic party and you have Democrats making concessions towards the Republican party. That is a move towards the center. You have individuals cooperating and talking with each other, talking about it, other people within a different party that could also put forward their interests. And those concessions, ladies and gentlemen, we think is good for a cooperation within democracy and puts forward those ideals that we'd like to put forward. And for all those reasons, Mr. Chair, we are very proud to oppose. I thank the Leader of Opposition for her speech. And now to continue the case on the Garmin bench, I'd like to call upon the Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, hold on a second. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm going to look at uh, the bulk of the LO uh, by looking at the definition of legitimacy and what it means by way of rebuttal. Okay? 
So he says it's legitimate to consider uh, what other people are going to do with their vote, possibly, because there's some benefit you get from that. So what do you say firstly? He said that, well, in the status quo, if I see a candidate leading in the polls, then I would feel it's a waste to not vote for him because my vote would be wasted if I vote for anyone else. Well, the first thing I want to point out is that there's little value, obviously, in giving a vote, your vote to a candidate who's going to win anyway according to the polls if you don't really like his policies. If you don't believe in his policies and you think that he just doesn't represent you, then why are you going to give him a vote anyway? It's of no value to you because he's going to win anyway according to your logic. So that any utility he described coexist doesn't exist. But secondly, you will say, Actually, there is a point in voting, even if you think someone else is going to win, obviously, according to the polls. Because the, the expression of your dissent, when aggregated among other people who also seem, seem to want to vote anyway, despite someone else going to win anyway, it's important to, to the government that gets, comes to power because the, the, the aggregated expression of the dissent that signals strong issues that governments must still deal with, even though they were elected by a majority. It puts pressure on them because no government wants to appear, even though they won elections, like they don't give a damn about minority groups. So the, the, the magnitude of the, the dissent is also very critical, and there's just a value in voting for someone, even if you think that someone else will win, obviously. Even in multi-party elections, so this, this, I think when he went to his last part of his speech, he said where there are like five candidates, and uh, maybe it's more strategic to work with someone else, uh, even though it's not, it's not my first choice, because that way I can uh, show up, uh, bolster the, the minority votes, and then maybe then kick out the guy I really hate, who seems to be leading anyway. But the problem with that kind of strategic voting is that there's no coordination among voters in the country when it comes to the, uh, to the day of elections. Like though I may know right now from a poll that 40% uh, love Obama, 10% love Gingrich, and 10% love someone else. And I think maybe, though I hate the guy, uh, uh, New King Rich, but I hate Obama more, and I should vote for New King Rich to make sure he has a chance of getting the power. Because I can't coordinate my vote with other voters out there, there's nothing they can guarantee, honestly, if they engage in the kind of political calculations. So again, even in, 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 even in the scenario, there's a little utility derived from trying, to, from trying to, look, to look at numbers. It doesn't really help you in any way to become, become a lot more informed and, 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 and allow your vote to, to have greater meaning. But this is where Lumpy, uh, LP, showed utility when you just focus on what you want. Sit down. When you vote purely based on the, on the candidate whom you think deserves your vote, and you don't allow him to look at numbers, and ordinary laymen, when we look at numbers, we tend to be a bit overwhelmed by it because you know, numbers scream a lot. It's very, it's very easy, like, oh, that guy's got 80% votes, or he's got 80% of the, of, the, of, the, of the support. You, you reduce the incentives and reduce the ability of the average voter to think harder and harder about the interests that he should really think about, especially when maybe in most countries there's still a lot of undecided, uncertain voters who are still thinking to the very last day to where they want to cast their vote. We think you get a better quality democracy on the outside of the house when your voters thinking a lot more, a lot more seriously about the issues, not thinking about what their neighbours think. Sit down. Furthermore, he told you as well in his speech, actually, I don't think he, uh, the leader of opposition tackled, that you actually increase the legitimacy of governments, uh, or rather the winners of these elections, because there will never be any question about whether or not you did or did not get the maximum voter turnout that may have been affected by what other people thought. This is critical because the one prime example we have is the Florida elections in 2000. Uh, Bush won by 500 votes in a, in a state of over 20 million people. And there was a lot of speculation that the reason why the vote should, she did not swing the way uh, of Al Gore was because people were influenced by the numbers that were being projected that show a clear, clear Bush victory and hence, Maple thought, my vote doesn't matter even though I, I want Al Gore more, but it doesn't matter so I don't turn up to vote. Already, voter turnout is an all-time low in many countries because people think that the vote doesn't change anything. Got one vote out of a million, how does it change anything at all? But the status quo as it is with, with election polls, it makes it even harder to, to tackle voter turnout and then make it harder for governments to win elections and be perceived as truly legitimate because they truly got the, the, the people voting for them who wanted them and never else showed up. So two pieces of extension in my speech. Okay. I'm going to look at uh, later obvious. I'm going to look at when it's truly legitimate to consider what other people are thinking and how we do that very well even in our policy. Then I'm going to look at uh, dominant parties, yep, and small groups. Okay. So when is it legitimate to consider what other people are thinking? It is when you're actually hearing arguments and ideas and reasons why you should follow what other people are thinking. So like, what we support in outside the house, you know, 
are things like newspapers making calls and saying we support Obama. We, we support the idea of having the status quo. Influential figures come and open and say I prefer that candidate and giving a reason why voters who are unsettled should listen to them. And we're okay with political rallies and huge numbers coming out and trying to impress upon the rest of the country the importance of the issues. Why is that, why is that good? Because though you are also going to think of what others are thinking about under our policy in that scenario, at least you have reasons uh, to play around with in your mind when you finally do decide who you vote for. That's better and that's, that's the only way it can be legitimate to consider what others are thinking because there are reasons that are challenging your point of view and that results in a more, more truly informed voter. We don't think numbers say anything meaningful at all in terms of how a voter believes or uh, 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 values his, his, his priorities because it doesn't change by, by a point of view. Oh, sorry. It doesn't give me anything more meaningful in terms of my, my ability to, to come up with a better approach and what thing makes sense for me and for other people. So that's why even in the status quo, if you wish to have people looking at what others are thinking about, it's better they look at arguments raised by others and not just look at a number. Second. So uh, we, we already told you in uh, LP speech about scenarios where you've got close call elections and why it's, 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 even, it's quite critical that we have a ban on such polls. But even in scenarios where you've got dominant parties, you know, in particular states in America, it's very important then for minority groups to not be oppressed or at least feel that there's very little point in them coming out to, 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 to express the point of view. Because it's very easy to feel you're always in the losing end of the vote when you're in a politically defined racial, geographical, linguistic group in many states. A ban on such polls makes it a little bit easier for, for their candidates, for their representatives to give them a glimmer of hope that there might be others who share the same point of view that, that, that you hold and this encourages minorities to, to come out to press for change and that's how you get a, a far more representative legitimate government. So in summary, I just don't see the benefit to any voter from thinking about numbers because in all the best scenarios there's little benefit but there is a benefit to governments when they have everyone thinking strictly about what they think makes sense and, on, and only what makes sense and for obvious reasons. We beg to propose. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for his speech, and to continue the case on the opposition, I'd like to call upon the Deputy Leader of Opposition. Okay. Hamid Karzai was elected as President of Afghanistan with almost less than 20% of the popular vote. In the midst of this, you had a mass opposition divided into multiple candidates that could have been repaired by telling this united opposition to the Karzai regime that they could have shifted their vote to someone else that they might have had some disagreements with. But the point was, if they all didn't want Karzai in power, you could have formed a united opposition. That was what Deputy Prime Minister didn't understand coming from Jared's speech. Because it isn't only about numbers and popularity, but I'm going to get to that later. It's also about creating an environment where individuals are fully represented. And I'm going to discuss later in my substantive why it's a valid strategy to use game theory if you all are in agreement that you want one party out of the running. But before that, let me settle two issues in construction and deconstruction at the same time. First one is legitimacy. Because what we could observe from the second speaker is he's forcing his own definition of a legitimate vote. In a POI earlier, I alluded that you could be libertarian and not vote at all, and that's a valid political opinion. There is no such limit in terms of what you're voting for and how you vote. Because society on principle respects your participation, how you define it, ladies and gentlemen. That's why we think that numbers on their own are also legitimate factors in terms of what you could use to construct your own informed opinion. Because this is the next thing he says. It's always only going to be better if it's in an argument or in a debate or through a platform. That isn't mutually exclusive. We have those two. And if your opinion is solidified around these areas, if you're a full-blown conservative, numbers won't matter to you. But numbers matter to those who are uncertain. People who are ready to make concessions if they are convinced. And what numbers do is it doesn't give you an objective opinion, but it gives you the opinion of the popular vote. 
why could it be that so many people support this particular stance or candidate? That's an indicator that maybe you should reconsider your stance, that you could reconsider your second opinion. So not only do you present a good election strategy, you also allow other individuals to take away from their staunch political position. Because the constructive part of this issue is we want to develop political maturity. And in that aspect, we don't want it to be purely a game of personalities. In that aspect, we think the numbers present a unique perspective, the popular opinion, and if you're a holder and you're away from that popular opinion, maybe, ladies and gentlemen, you could shift and your stance a little, maybe, ladies and gentlemen, you could consider actor, other factors, but that's a legitimate factor, just as jingles are in campaigns, just like how platform posters are in campaigns, we don't think that they're any different. But what can we conclude? Popularity on its own may not be the most effective intellectual political position. But it's a valid political strategy to take because in terms of popularity, if it appeals to the lowest common denominator and you actually sway an individual to supporting you because of that and the number allows you to analyze other candidates that you might not have considered before, these are all good things for political maturity to develop. Next point, let's talk about game theory. Earlier I alluded to Hamid Karzai. We've seen this with on multiple levels. We've seen President Mukherjee in India experience this to a limited degree before he got elected. In the Philippines, no thank you, Benigno Aquino was elected with less than 40% of the vote. What does this mean? It means that occasionally, especially in elections with multiple candidates, you elect people who aren't supported by a majority of the population on the ground. In fact, we'd argue that you might have 70 or 60% of the population not in agreement that this person should be in power. What do polls allow you to do? Your polls allow you to make concessions both on the level of voters and on the level of candidates. In terms of candidates, you could see from the Republican primary, for example, when you see that you're not going to win, you start supporting an alternative candidate whom you think could take your position better. That's why early on Bachman pulled out of the election. That's why Sarah Palin pulled out of the, president of the Republican primary. That's why Santorum, towards the end, supported Romney over Gingrich, which I disagree with because I really like Newt. Um, what we can suggest, ladies and gentlemen, is game theory is a perfectly plausible strategy. Because though you might disagree on levels of gay marriage or abortion, you all agree that you don't want Obama in power, right? You all agree that you want to present that conservative standpoint. And it might not even be in a US election, but the relevant context is this. If you're in agreement that you don't want one person in power, but individually your voices are too silent to put a chink in that armor, to put a dent in that election, then you could coalize and create units that inherently unite that opposition and force people to listen to you. Because we think, ladies and gentlemen, it's abhorrent to have people elected into power when they hold less than 40 or less than 30% of the general popular vote. That's the reason why Karzai's government can't get a foothold against the Taliban. No. It's because so many people dislike him, but he won because he was the biggest minority among no. lots and lots of minorities. We think that game theory is a perfectly plausible strategy. Secondly, it's also about voters no. giving concessions. One minute. We think, ladies and gentlemen, that when voters concede and move their opinions around, you get to unite voices that would have otherwise been ignored. Because if minorities become too small after elections, and this is their assumption, right? When, ele when, they, when minorities get too small after elections, you end up forgetting that they were actually there to begin with. You end up having independents not listened to at all. You end up having German party lists, for example, in the German context, not being listened to because they never get that big of a say. Yeah. We think that polls will allow you to coalize, and that's a great thing to have in the status quo. Asha. If you say the opinion polls result in certain losing candidates like Parkman pulling out of the race, isn't there a risk that some of them might pull out prematurely because they just don't believe in any chance? You have pullouts that happen even for small for smaller reasons, like when you finally agree that your stance is inferior to another candidate. We think that it's also a valid strategy to use numbers in that regard. But the final thing I want to argue is the idea of how they're great indicators of the needs of the public. We have to go back to America and look at swing states. Why is it incredibly relevant that we have polls, given that we have contexts like electoral colleges? It's because we give attention to political campaigns and draw their attention towards places where people have not formed a concrete opinion about the matters at hand. It's a great tool for political dynamism and campaign dynamism at that, because polls allow you to strategize and see where people are uncertain, where you fail to create a solid opinion, where it isn't red or blue as of yet. And we think that that's great, because in terms of allowing for these swing states to come to a concrete opinion, polls will allow people to strategize and allow these people to come up to an opinion, to have their political maturity, and to determine for themselves who to vote for. 
you need campaigns to know this so that they could mobilize the people there, so they could put up their posters there, and they could put up more information in these areas. <laughs> what do we stand for? We stand for polls because polls as numbers present a unique perspective. The perspective of popularity and the perspective of numbers, which have a tangible effect to elections. We question, granted that it's so tangible and it's so important, why would we preclude people who need it to function, who need it to have a good election, from having it? We're very proud of polls. Thanks. I thank the Deputy Leader of Opposition for his speech, and now to start the case on the lower half of the debate, could I call upon the Member of the Government. very good job. So because they say and they said the very clear stance and we agree with these kind of things. It means that people should vote purely based on their interest or purely based on their will. And by taking this proposal, we strongly believe we can, uh, we can, uh, we can remove these kinds of external effects towards these kinds of voting action, and we can ensure more good elections. That is a basic stance, and we agree with the opening government. So I have the, I have the, the closing government. I, I, I want to more further analyze what's happened under the, as firstly, the extension is about the why we can ban, especially about the political opinion poll. So from the closing government, I want to compare with another thing, like the threatening uh, threatening people to vote some, uh, something by using the gun or so forth, or maybe they're using the money or so forth. I want to compare these kinds of another banning act, uh, criteria. And secondary, I want to furthermore explain about the why the political opinion poll has a strong power, uh, especially we are talking about the inaccuracy of these kinds of political opinion poll, uh, pol pol political opinion poll, why NBC it is a very dangerous, and secondary about the group dynamics. So I, anyway, no thank you. Let me engage with what the previous speaker said. So firstly, the new argument coming from the previous speaker is about the, they have the right to avoid someone who really, uh, who someone really hate, uh, avoid these kinds of candidate becomes a president. But the thing is, <coughs> firstly, rather more, if the one person has the maybe the 40% popularity, in such kind of situation, the, a lot of citizens think they give up to defend these kinds of things because they, he has a strong majority power and the people cannot come up with a united uh, opposition party, all of the opposition party, and uh, against these kinds of things. Lots of more people have the tendency to just give up and didn't vote and just forced by these kinds of things. Lots of more we say, if you think about the election or voting itself, the voting is the only way to reflect your idea properly and accurately. Why is that? The same pre because <coughs> even if your candidate cannot get the position, it is not so useless. Because by disclosing these kinds of information about the who gets how many persons vote, it is a, can be an incentive to think about the a, a president or who elected elected candidate can think about these kinds of opinion as well because they have a strong incentive to re-elect again. In such kind of situation, they care about another person's idea. And if we, if they, if they can visualize these kinds of idea by seeing the actual vote, which visualized by voting, pure voting, and we say that is more effective. And moreover, we say what they say to talking about is about the. Uh, 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 just a moment, no thank you. <laughs> They're talking about the concession. So by seeing the political opinion poll, they can 
makes a concession between the candidate and between the voter or so forth. So firstly, even after the election, they can make the concession. And rather more, we say, by seeing these kinds of pure uh, results of the information about the full vote and how many people, forget, uh, ha, ha, what, which policy gets uh, how many votes, by seeing these kinds of, in, uh, by seeing kinds of information, Sorry. there is a more accurately con a con makes a concession between the people to people. So therefore we say, even after the, <coughs> after the election, they can make the concession. So therefore we say, there's a no unique ar argument coming from the opening government. Yes. This is the context. You have a president who is elected, but the majority of people in your country never agreed for you to be in power. Why shouldn't an opposition have the leeway to unite under a stronger banner? The president is not a king or emperor. There is another way to deter the crazy president doing some crazy things. The, there is a senate is exist or there is a congress is exist. There is a, another way to you can sue the court and the supreme court is also exist. In such kinds of democratic process, if the, these kinds of people, the majority of the citizens, against these kinds of president, there is a also alternative way is exist. Rather more the closing government, we want to emphasize that both is a very, very important. Pure vote is very, very important if you think about the uh, nature of the vote because it is the only way to reflect your idea properly to these kinds of political <coughs> arena. So anyway, let me move on to my extension. First of all, I want to compare the criteria of how we, why we can ban and why the states should ban these kinds of things. So for example, the several things we already ban under the current situation, like the threatening by the gun, please vote me, and in such kind of situation, we already arrested. Or maybe you give the money to the rogue and oh, please give me vote or some kind of other thing. It is also we ban. Why is that? Because of we, the government take care about the pure vote of these kinds of citizens, Mr. Speaker. Because by threatening or by giving the money, these kinds of citizens' minds distorted by these kinds of money or votes. And the closing government strongly believe the political opinion poll have all the same effect. Why is that? That is my second extension. The, simply, uh, <coughs> the political opinion poll, first the problem is the inaccuracy. Because the media are doing these kinds of things, and the media have strong incentive to distort these kinds of things, yeah, yeah. like the Fox News or so forth. And in such kinds of situations, so for example, like the how-to question can change the uh, result of the political opinion poll, or where you get the, uh, where you get the information, it's also changing or makes the biased result of these kinds of things. And the problem of these kinds of political opinion poll is that people misunderstood. Oh, that is what the, all people within my country think. And we say that is a dangerous. So firstly, because this inaccuracy point directly attacks the opening opposition side argument, because their argument is entirely based on these kinds of uh, result of the political opinion poll is an accurate, uh, accurate result. But we say it is a no, because this just surprised uh, anyway. So, and secondly, about the <coughs> group dynamics. So, Mr. Speaker, as I said, the people misunderstood by seeing the political opinion poll. If the Romney or Obama has a very big, power, a very big popularity, people think and misunderstood. Oh, many persons supporting these kinds of party, and we say that is a dangerous because they. If the Romney talking about something, people can see behind the Romney the many, many citizens supporting these kinds of things. And we say that is a not good effect. And especially if we are talking about the third party, it is a very, very unfair. Even if their policy is very, very good, because of the existence of the political uh, opinion poll, the Romney or sometimes uh, the Obama can strengthen by using the political opinion poll. And we say, Mr. Speaker, citizens should examine your voting by based on purely based on the policy or your own interest. <coughs> so therefore we say we are very proud to propose the motion. Thank you. I thank the member of government for a speech now to extend on the opposition side, may I call upon the member of the opposition. Here he is.
Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, opening opposition told you how numbers are necessary for individual voters. We on closing opposition tell you how vote numbers are necessary for politicians in order to enrich democracy because numbers pressurizes politicians to act in certain ways that they would otherwise not have done, which is why we are very proud to stand on the opposition in today's debate. We're going to talk to you about three things. Firstly, we're going to talk to you about what statistics represent, and we're going to be extending opening opposition's arguments on there and basing substantive of our own. Secondly, we're going to be talking about how politicians are going to be using this how politicians are going to be using this stat to improve democracy. And third of all, we're going to be talking about how um, how politicians can make the appropriate exit strategy to run away from primaries. But before that, several points of rebuttal, right? Firstly, we get two um, really nearly simple, like, uh, similar arguments from the uh, government benches. We get from OG that numbers makes voters irresponsible. Mr. Speaker, there is no obligation in a liberal democracy that says voters have to be responsible in their current paradigm, right? We don't think, therefore, no thank you, if, that people have to convey their opinions accurately in the first place because they have a choice firstly not to vote they have a choice to donkey vote if they want to we don't think there is any moral obligation on their side of the house to say that voting has to be responsible no thank you then we get this idea from closing proposition that says numbers are fundamentally coercive and they give you the example of media media are coercive without numbers anyway right Fox News gives biased information regardless of whether they say Obama has only a 30% approval rating or not. So we don't really think that it's the numbers that play into the arguments of closing proposition, no thank you, but the, na the, the nature of media itself. We think that we've successfully debunked them on that side. But even if, Mr. Speaker, numbers do matter, we think that numbers matter in the way that it gives politicians something to act on. And that brings me nicely to the first extension. Right? Uh, no thank you. <coughs> right, what opening opposition told you is that numbers represent a collective and holistic information about the popular vote. What we tell you on our side, on closing opposition, Mr. Speaker, no thank you, is that it actually also represents the numbers you need to get in order to get elected into office from the politicians, right? It's not 47% does not necessarily, does not only mean 47% of the population support you. It also, as the opening opposition says, it also says, Mr. Speaker, and we get this in closing, that 53% of the population don't support you and you can't get a majority unless you do better. So these kind of incentives actually pressurizes politicians to do better and to perform better, right? What happened in the pre first of the presidential debates between Obama and Romney is that, Ro that 40% of the population thought that Pre Le Romney won the first of the televised debates as opposed to 25%, no thank you, for people who thought that Obama had won the debate. This actually pressurized Obama into making better election promises, pressurized Obama into making better election strategies to improve upon the things that he had, so he probably did better in the second debate. We don't really know, right? <laughs> no, thank you. So what we tell you, Mr. Speaker, it's not only that it pressurizes individual voters to change their voting strategy, it also pressurizes politicians to become closer to the population, to listen to the population. It also pressurizes them to conform to the majority. And I'll take the opening. Look, let me kill your extension now. Politicians can do surveys and polls without publishing them. Yeah, yeah. But, Mr. Speaker, politicians can do... <coughs> Right, it's all about not having polls, right? That's what you said on your side of the house, so I don't really see why you can put that point of information out now in the first place. But even if that was the case, Mr. Speaker, it gives a lot, the, the public current paradigm of polls gives a lot more accurate opinion, right? Because people are fundamentally biased. Democrats are more likely to ask registered Democratic voters about how their presidents are doing, right? They're not going to knock on the door of Mitt Romney and say, hey, how do you think Obama's doing right now, right? <laughs> we think, Mr. Speaker, because people are fundamentally biased, you're not going to get a whole holistic picture unless you have a public third-party organization publishing these results, which think, we think deals with that point of information, right? So what we tell you on our side, firstly, Mr. Speaker, from the first and second extensions, is that both numbers are not only like numbers 
from, to, it's from the perspective of individual voters to change their voting strategy. It's also a yardstick for politicians to change their decisions. It's also a yardstick for politicians to associate themselves with the candidate. And that enriches democracy in a far more better way, right? Because suddenly, you, suddenly Obama is under pressure to be re-elected, and then he doesn't have the majority that is required. It means that he's better able to act on these kind of premises and make sure that... <coughs> He delivers these kind of changes. No, thank you. What do we tell you from the third extension? We tell you, like, opening opposition talks about how you can have a unified opposition for, because voters change their strategy. We see that this applies to the politicians too, right? The reason Herman Cain pulled out of the elections was because nobody was voting for him. He had, like, 25%. Maybe he got sick of saying 999. I don't know, right? But the end, the, the end result is, Mr. Uh, Speaker, Herman Cain saw those figures and said, I'm yeah, not going to yeah. run for this election anymore. It wasn't the voters that changed it. It was the politician's decision himself that at the end of the day that decided, right? That it works in more ways than one, right? Because we get people like Ron Paul who didn't pull out, right? But also, Mr. Speaker, what we tell on our side is that numbers do matter to these politicians, right? What we don't have under their paradigm is... Pro the candidates withdrawing their run for the primaries, right? Yeah, you get yeah, yeah. Michelle Bachman running, you get uh, Rick Perry running, you get, I, I forgot who running, right? In the Republican <laughs> primaries. And then the voters are really at a loss, right? Because who portrays their best accurate position now, now that you have five or six people to choose from, yeah, yeah. which debunks the idea of the opening proposition, which says that you must have a choice. We say that too many choices is also a bad thing when it comes to making choices in itself, yeah, yeah. right? Opp opposition says it's best reactive if you can best choose. We say that if you have too many options, you end up not being able to choose at all, which is counterproductive to the idea of democracy, on what we, we think, Mr. Speaker. What has closing opposition told you in today's debate? We told you that numbers represent a far more credible statistic and the pressure that politicians can act upon and change their policy to associate themselves with the people. We say that that enriches democracy in more ways than it does harm, and we are very proud to oppose. I thank the member of opposition for a speech and now to conclude on the government bench may I call upon the government whip. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are two questions at the end of this debate. Firstly, I'm going to discuss whether or not there's a unique necessity for those opinion polls to exist in a decision-making process in a democracy. And secondly, I'm going to talk about whether or not poll is the actual legitimate basis of the decision-making process, because we are far from the opening opposition. Those objective facts should be the basis of the decision-making process if, they, if the students want it to be. We think, Mr. Speaker, this argument is predicated upon the assumption that those uh, information is correct and can be trusted, Mr. Speaker, um, and that, that, which we contested from closing government, and that we don't think these, uh, these are the uh, legitimate tool of the decision making process. So on to my first question, which is about whether or not there's a unique necessity for these opinion polls to exist as opposed to other sources of information which are available in the status quo. Now, Mr. Speaker, what we have from the opening opposition from the first and second speaker is that those politicians can make decisions as to, for example, like uh, having coalitions or even pull out so that they can win over the majority which they really hate, Mr. Speaker. Now, we go in from the closing government, Mr. Speaker, that is not mutually exclusive, right? Because obviously, even after the elections, those uh, the opposition parties can unite with each other so that they can win over the ruling party, right? Let's take, take the example of a case where, for example, the ruling party has support from the 30%, and the two opposition parties, which have the, who have similar ideas, have 20% support on each party, Mr. Speaker. In those circumstances, by looking at the number of seats they got and the election, they can choose to uh, form a coalition after those elections, right? And then we don't think that was mutually exclusive in the first place. But secondly, more importantly, uh, the coalition on the upper of them is better than their for them. Why, Mr. Speaker? Because as we told you in our extension, those opinion polls results tend to be inaccurate 
accurate, and therefore those politicians might be making a wrong decision based upon the inaccurate information, and therefore it might not be a wise decision for the politician to be well looking at the results of poll in the status quo, Mr. Speaker. The election results are more accurate, Mr. Speaker, and sorting the information for the politician to base their decision about whether or not they pull out, whether or not they have the coalition, and therefore we think Armado oh, can better achieve in that regard. Now, when we heard from closing opposition in their extension list, first of all, politicians will be, uh, are affected by the opinion polls as well as citizens. He talks about how, Mr. Speaker, like politicians will uh, uh, have incentive to do well after looking at the results of opinion polls, uh, drawing the example how Obama, like that, did better in the second uh, uh, presidential debate. Mr. Speaker, firstly, in general, politicians have extreme amount of incentive to do well, even without those opinion polls, right? Because obviously, those Obama and Romney have massive incentive to elect themselves, and there's a reason why, Mr. Speaker, they're trying extremely hard to, for example, put money in their campaign, and also extremely, uh, like, do, do as, as well as possible in those presidential, presidential debates. We don't think those opinion polls are unique in, 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 like, in terms of increasing the incentive on the part of the politician. But secondly, Mr. Speaker, we think that like, we are opposing a public pu publishing of opinion polls, right? Well, the problem we are providing uh, providing to you from the government side is that those citizens are unduly influenced by the publishing of those opinion polls, right? If those politicians uh, uh, need those opinion polls to know about their circumstances, they can form their own groups to uh, ask uh, citizens about whether or not they support them, right? Now, the response coming from the closing uh, member of the opposition is that those, uh, those like, voters will not answer, Mr. Speaker, to the uh, like polls done by the politicians themselves. But that's odd, right? Because we told you from closing government health, even now, the actor, which are making opinion polls that are biased to some extent, we, we told the example of folks at MSNBC. And therefore, given that even now, those media are not like trusted entirely, Mr. Speaker, those media are not really objective, but rather they are biased to some extent. We, we don't think that those politicians themselves are different from those biased media which are doing opinion polls in the status quo, and therefore, we don't think there will be massive change in the status quo in the after plan in terms of the effect or the incentive of politicians. Now, lastly, in the extension, they talked about how in the after plan, Mr. Speaker, uh, like, 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 you know, uh, they extended the idea from opening opposition about how politicians cannot pull out, uh, uh, can, cannot make smart decisions about whether or not they pull out. Mr. Speaker, the reason why Rick San Firma, Rick, uh, 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 like Firma, Rick Perry, uh, withdrew from uh, their like, uh, presidential elections no, was not really, no, was not actually because of, for example, results of uh, uh, those opinions polls. Right? The, res uh, the reason why they withdrew was because, uh, Mr. Speaker, they actually lost in the primary uh, results, right, Mr. Speaker? And therefore, primary election was the real reason why they pull out, not the results of the opinion polls, which are published by the media, right? And therefore, by seeing those actual results, Mr. Speaker, the uh, real results of the elections, for example, primary elections and so forth, they can make decisions, that kind of thing, and therefore, we don't need those opinion polls to, uh, for the politicians to make that decision, and therefore, that's the response to the entire case. So moving on to my second point, which is about whether or not polls are listing a basis of the decision-making process before the audit court. We told you two things clearly, that we can unite an opposition, and we can make you rethink your less popular opinion. So are you prepared to defend that if we buy better calculators and your election survey is accurate, you're okay with it? Like, first of all, Mr. Speaker, we told you how those uh, uh, polls tend to be inaccurate. Uh, so uh, that's what, what I'm going to explain in my second issue. So which is about like, where there are the polls the legitimate basis of the decision-making process. Now, where we go from opening opposition is that those polls are objective facts and therefore that should be regarded as a valid tool for people to use in the decision-making process. But we told you how, Mr. Speaker, uh, that it is questionable whether or not the quality of these surveys results is, 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 is like really correct or accurate, Mr. Speaker, because the reason why we have to care about these, like, uh, the accuracy of results is because, Mr. Speaker, we can people should, be, uh, uh, should base their decision purely on their own opinions, right? And therefore, Mr. Scott, and the goal of democracy is that people base their decision-making process on the genuine wants and genuine needs, and that is why, Mr. Speaker, we can maximize their utility and maximize their, uh, uh, achieve their benefits and rights in the process of democracy. And therefore, we think that if those quote, uh, the quality of this specific information is not trustable, Mr. Speaker, and it's not credible, we think that this is not a legitimate tool for the people to use, Mr. Speaker. And that was exactly what we told you from causing government. We told you how, Mr. Speaker, Polls tend to be inaccurate because A, those media have massive incentive to destroy the information. For example, they can select where they uh, collect their opinions, or Mr. Speaker, they can, uh, they, they can ask things like, for example, whether or not they support or not support, but they can hope the people in the middle to opposition, Mr. Speaker, in this kind of way. Or uh, if, if those things are not done, Mr. Speaker, like if, if 1,000 people are targeted in those opinion polls, the media can, 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 let, can, uh, can make it look like, for example, it is, it is tantamount to the actual results of elections, although people who have participated in the opinion polls making process. 
process is not like tantamount to the actual population of elections, right? And in this kind of many ways, uh, media can bias, uh, can bias the results of opinion polls. The response comes from closing office to say that this, this is not going to be different under our proposal because obviously those media can be biased without its opinion polls. But this is the thing, right? If those media, even though they might be biased, in the, uh, in the other proposal, they will be forced to compel to provide the reasons, right? Instead of those opinion polls, instead of those numbers. And that is why even if they are biased, there can be a criticism or there can be a discourse toward those reasons, right? Provided by MSNBC or folks. As opposed to this, Mr. Speaker, because those numbers seem like or look like objective facts, Mr. Speaker, which cannot be challenged, those biased media can utilize this unique factor or the shield of respectability of those opinion polls to, uh, Mr. Speaker, to, to make it look like the opinions are absolutely correct. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, those biased media can have undue influence by utilizing this unique tool of political opinion polls. And that is the reason why, Mr. Speaker, we have to change the incentive by forcing them to rely upon what, uh, other like reasonings and so forth, Mr. Speaker, which in that will go into like, increase the quality of information citizens have, and therefore we are going to uh, improve the quality of decision-making process for those loads of reasons we are extremely proud to propose. I thank the government whip for his speech, and now to conclude today's debate and the opposition bench, I'd like to call upon the opposition whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members of this house. It's really funny to hear from the closing government that they are written, that, that they have been printed, that they have been provided the new posting materials, such as issue of irrationality, etc. But we think that that is complete rubbish, because opening government has talking about in the first place. At the same time, sourcing is not the reason to take this post off, right? Because the information has been already distorted, and sourcing will never be so, within their parliament, we think in the first place, people are irrational all the time. At the same time, it's impossible to guarantee the perfect rationality, right? <coughs> we stay on our side of the house. What we have to consider is what kind of circumstances is best for citizens to decide certain degree. In this situation, who is the best actor, uh, who is the key actor to contribute to decision making? In this situation, that is a position that was explained by my partner. This is why we are superior to their side of the house. We have the two issues to talk about. Firstly, let me, let me analyze the incentive of voters and what we think source the analysis we coming from the government is totally uh, invalid, uh, not valuable in this day. Secondly, I'm going to talk about issue of my panel's extension concerns issue of incentive of politicians, how this actually achieve and contributing to the uh, better democracy within the country. No, thank you. Firstly, on to the issue of the rationality. We have the same logic from the closing government and opening government, basically saying the information has been distorted. At the same time, people are <coughs> irrational reporting. That's the problem we have the other side of the house. But we have several response. Firstly, in the first place, information has been already biased. Like the case of New York Times, sourcing has been problem trying to provide information, uh, trying to, pro uh, try to provide and broadcasting based on the liberal idea. No, thank you. Sourcing has already distorted. At the same time, we still allow the negative campaign in the case of the United States, which we try to put emphasis on negative side of politicians. We still happy to do those kind of things. Therefore, the, even if those kind of information itself is a bias, there is a still good to let them allow to do so. Because there is no responsibility just because people are irrational, Mr. Speaker. At the same, therefore, we say sourcing is not a problem at all in the, at the end of the day. But at the same time, we have already pointed out, uh, as, as I have already pointed out in my introduction, it is pretty, pretty obvious. It is impossible to guarantee the perfect rationality of an individual. What we have to do is try to provide the circumstances which are necessary, uh, which is necessary for the decision-making process at the end of the day. Therefore, we say sourcing is completely uh, irrelevant at the end of the day. You know, thank you. Now, at the same time, second thing we have from the opening government was basically the minority has been oppressed. 
Well, it's funny. They're still under their policy. Minority are minority. It is impossible to change their circumstances. How do they change that? They never explain to us in this first place. Therefore, we say sourcing is completely irrelevant at the end of the day. At the same time, another policy materials we heard from the closing government is because sourcing is something like coercive measure, such as the sweating. Uh, unless you vote me, I'm gonna kill you. Well, that's funny. It's totally different from the cases of what we are talking about. Well, because so no, thank you. Because that is. That will be completely coercive, Mr. Speaker, if we force individual to take the choices that they have to vote for a particular individual. But, no, thank you. Because the case of the outside of the house cases, people will choose to a certain degree by influence by the media. But still, there is people who want to choose a particular politician, Mr. Speaker. If there are people think, even if people perceive so saying it's very important, uh, the, uh, supporting Obama is better, what the majority will think. There is still people who won't vote for the Obama, still try to vote for Romney. Therefore, no thank you. This is not the reason to take this proposal. And moving on to my panel's extension, concerned issue, politicians' incentive. The opening government has been basically talking about voters' incentive. But my panel has specifically explained to you from the perspective of politicians' incentive, Mr. Speaker, which is completely important to establish further, further develop democracy. But as my panel has already told you, no thank you. At the same time, what kind of incentives are there for the politicians? Politicians, because there are certain criteria that they can value whether they have been supported by the individuals, supported by the citizens, they are, whether they are not being supported by the citizens, therefore they can know what kind of efforts should be, uh, should be done. Only the response we heard from the closing government was something like, because the inner status quo, they have incentive to do so, even if under their paradigm, they will still try to do so. No, thank you. The difference between their paradigm and our paradigm is very simple. Because there are objectively evaluation from the third party, meaning that the politicians don't try to, co try to consider only by themselves. No, thank you. Because there are people who actually try to vote in. Because of the existence of those border, border we think, uh, the tradition we perceive, so yeah. um, how do they act, no thank you. Because there are information that how to value whether they are being supported, therefore they can do the better, be, do the, do the better effort for the concern, the issue, uh, concern the issue of political election, Mr. Speaker, such as try to change yeah. the stance to uh, the healthcare policy concerning the United States, or <coughs> any other kind of, such as abortion debate or gay marriage, uh, issue concern, gay marriage, etc. Sourcing is far more better than the status quo. Why? Because we can achieve a certain degree of the maximization of maximization of reflection of individual opinion rather than the status quo. Therefore we say sourcing is extremely yeah. important. Sir. Now I take the point of the closing. So the, these kinds of distorted in incentive of the media supported by these kinds of visualized image of these kinds of majority citizens supporting the Obama or supporting, supporting the Romney. Why these kinds of coercive power is okay under the current situation if you're against the money or threatening to another person? <laughs> so your argumentation is something like prohibiting media, right? Because the media itself has been already distorted. Yeah, the, 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 so what they want to do is simply try to prohibit the media. But the, the, the contradiction of the CSI House is basically they are not opposing the existence <coughs> of media itself. They have to explain to us specific reasons Sir. to take this proposal. No, thank you. Mr. Speaker, we, therefore we say in the first place, their extension itself doesn't stand. At the same time, the case of the opening government has been already doubted by my partner's extension concerned because the existence of politicians, uh, firstly simply because the voters have no incentive, at the same time, the politicians' incentive will contribute to the in, uh, action, better, uh, achieving better democracy in the country. We already specified to you the clear difference between the paradigm of status quo and after plan. Concern the issue of there are objective criteria which has been which will influence the action of politicians, which is completely important because this will actually affect the entire policy in the first place. Therefore, we say social extension is important. But the second thing we like point out is the response we have from the government wave is basically the talking about coalition can be achieved even in, under their power line. But this argumentation is based on one assumption that information is accurate. But we told you on the side of the house. So saying is actually irrelevant at the end of the day because their assumption is based on those things, but we told you so the information is not the reason to run the tree bound something. They are also limitation that is my our side of the case CSM. We told you on our side of the house, very simple thing. The politician is one of the important actors which influence influence the democracy and we, we this is a unique contribution which has been brought by, by my partner. That's why we say we have to oppose the motion. <laughs> Thank you. I thank you all for the debate. Cross the floor and shake hands as you guys are doing. We will exit the room now and I'll hand over to Orcom.